the pattern of the house churches. So today we're going to look at the pattern for the house church, exactly how we can have a house church in your house, even in your business, wherever you want to gather. We're going to look at the practical ways of having a house church and running a house church. And so we're looking at the gathering today and how we're going to do that gathering. And my name is Warren David Horrock from Father's Heart International Ministries. I'm just so glad to be able to share this with you. Like I said, the Lord has, we've, I've spent the last 18 years and the Lord has been just showing me step by step how to gather and we've made lots of mistakes. I've made plenty of mistakes. So um, we're learning every single day. We learn some more from the Lord and we're in, in no ways am I going to say this is the perfect, perfect pattern, but it's really, He's developed it over the many years and hundreds and hundreds of gatherings we've had um, of really how to encounter the Lord. And that's really what it's about, helping people to encounter the Lord. And that's why we we don't just call it a gathering, we call it a divine enca- encounter. Um, and also when we do it on a more public basis, we call it gatherings of fire, where we help people to encounter the, the, the divine presence of, of the Lord. So um, what we're going to look at now is, is um, first of all, we're going to look at Moses and David as examples, how they built according to the pattern, or actually the Lord gave Moses the pattern, gave David the pattern, and then Solomon, his son, built the, the tabernacle. And, uh, you know, we, we're going to look at how they, re- they received the pattern, and when they received the pattern, and they built the pattern according to God's pattern in heaven, the glory and the fire came. So we're just going to look at this, and, and the Lord is rebuilding the tabernacle of, of Moses. So we're going to look at the first scripture I want to look at, um, and, and sorry, cut there. The Lord is rebuilding the tabernacle of David. And he says now in, uh, in uh, Acts chapter 15, he says here, After this I'll return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. Um, there's a lot of revelation in the tabernacle of David and, uh, and, and what is the tabernacle of David. So we're not going to go into that right now, but he says here also, so see that the rest, so that the rest, and this is the important thing, is what is the purpose of the tabernacle of David? The purpose of the tabernacle of David is so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Remember, when in the Old Testament it was only the Jews that could really seek the Lord, according to the pattern that God gave to Moses on the mountain. And now God wants the nations to serve him and to seek him. So when David's tabernacle is restored and rebuilt, the nations will come into the tabernacle of David, which is a spiritual pattern, not just a physical pattern, but a spiritual pattern that the Lord is releasing in these days. And the Lord is restoring the tabernacle of David. And it says, yeah, even all these Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. So the Lord over the last 2,000 years, has been restoring the tabernacle of David. And we are going to see, before the Lord returns, the glory of the Lord return to the church. And we are going to be a glorious church. And this is just, we're living in such exciting times. The times are extremely difficult and uh, there's a lot of darkness. But he says, the glory of the Lord shall arise upon you. And the glory of the Lord is going to rise upon us more and more. Even as the times go darker, the glory of the Lord is coming more and more into into the church according to Isaiah 60. All right, so let's just look at look at the how it works in the Word of God. You will find out that when the pattern was correct, then the fire and the glory come. So the first one we're going to look at is Moses. I'm reading from Hebrews 8 verse 5. He says here, Who served the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. So Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle of exactly how he to make it. In other words, he saw a pattern. For he said, see, the Lord said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So Moses had to climb the mountain. There's a spiritual mountain we have to climb. And when we climb this mountain, the Lord shows us the heavenly pattern. There's a pattern in heaven. Moses saw the pattern in heaven. He brought it to earth and he made a physical tabernacle. Now in the New Testament, we are a spiritual tabernacle. We are living stones. And the Lord is busy arranging the stones in areas and in cities. And he's bringing these stones together in order to rebuild the tabernacle of David. But 
This is not a physical tabernacle. It's not a physical building. This is a spiritual building that the Lord is building. Now, it says in uh, Exodus, now, basically, after he had built the tabernacle, this is Moses, and he had he built it exactly according to the pattern. It says here, then the glory, uh, sorry, the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So there's a cloud that covers it, which is his presence, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses, Moses, who was the most humble man on earth, was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And it was a tabernacle of meeting. That means it was a place where Moses could go and meet the Lord. The high priest could go and meet the Lord. And at the end of the day, it was a whole pattern to show us from the outer court to the holy place, to the holy of holies, of the relationship that that God wanted with man. And he's saying, this is my pattern. And and there's so much revelation when we study the tabernacle and i've i've spent years studying the tabernacle and the lord said to me that that is a pattern for gathering that is a pattern for the divine encounter that's a pattern for our relation with the lord the outer court the holy place and the holy of holies that is such a powerful pattern that the lord has given us to understand that there's first an outer court ministry there's the holy place and then there's the holy of holies which is the place of intimacy with the father and with jesus through the holy spirit so the next example is David and Solomon, the tabernacle that uh, they built. When I say they built it, and this is a very important thing to understand because um, David had it in his heart to build a tabernacle and a house for God. And then the father said to him, you can't build it because you've been a man of war and you've, you've killed many people and there's basically blood on your hands. So because of that, he said he's going to raise up a son and his son was Solomon. So Solomon was commissioned by the Lord and David to build the house. So David got the pattern from heaven. This is very important to understand. The pattern was given to David. The finances and all the equipment and everything was given to David. And he then handed it over to his son and commissioned his son to build the house. So it was basically what you call a joint venture between David and Solomon. So a lot of people call it Solomon's temple. Um, But actually that was David's tabernacle that Solomon built. Because the Lord gave David, uh, David the, uh, it was in David's heart, he had the pattern, and he, had the, uh, he funded it, and he actually designed the, the, all the, the furniture and everything that went in there. But let's have a look. It says here in um, 1 Chronicles 28, it says here, Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule, its houses, its treasuries, its, uh, its upper chambers, its inner chambers, and the place of the mercy seat. So the, David had the plans, and God had given him the plans, and the plans for all that he had by the Spirit. So the Spirit of God gave him the plans of the courts of the house of the Lord, and of all the chambers all around, of the treasuries of the house of God, and the treasuries for the dedicated things. That's 1 Chronicles 28. So when Solomon had built according to the pattern that, that God had given to David, God sent his glory. So now Solomon... Uh, receives wisdom, he receives understanding, and he builds this awesome house for the Lord. It says here, So all the work that Solomon had done for the house of the Lord was finished, and Solomon brought in the things which his father David had dedicated. So David had dedicated the, uh, furniture, and, and then Solomon brought them in. And that was in 2 Chronicles 5. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and the singers were as one. This is very important because now we see the whole the, the importance of praise and worship, and not just praise and worship, but thanksgiving, praise and worship. So when the singers were one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. Notice they were not just praising the Lord, they were thanking the Lord. When they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music, and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. Again, the cloud comes in. So that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. And this is this is the most exciting thing, part for me is that we are going to get to a place where all over South Africa and all over the nations there are going to be gatherings when the glory of the Lord just manifests. 
and we won't even be able to stand in His glory. The glory of God will just fill the temple and God Himself will minister to His people. God Himself, through His glory, will transform His people. And God will, Himself will deliver the people from demons. And God Himself will heal people from sickness and disease instantly. God is going to come in with His glory. And we, we have never seen a move of God. We've seen great moves of God like the Zuzu Street, Street Revival. We've seen great moves, but the move that is coming is greater than any move we've ever seen. And this is what we must look forward to. And this is what we, we, are, we are seeking and we are positioning ourselves right now for the coming glory. The coming glory. And this is now not in just in church, as you would normally say, church. This is going to come to your house. So these, this is why the Lord has put on my heart to give you these teachings. Is because God's glory, He wants to come into your house. He wants you to host His glory in, his, in your house so that you can be touched, your neighbors can be touched, and your community can be touched. So that you can, at any point in time, you can actually invite the Lord into your house. And you say, Lord, He says, where two or three are gathered, there I am. So he's there ready. He just he wants to come in a more and more powerful way as we make way for him and as we, we position ourselves for his glory. And this is, this is the purpose of these teachings is to get us ready to receive the glory of the Lord. And then when the glory of the Lord comes, the harvest is going to come in and we're going to literally, the church is going to explode. The other day when we were seeking the Lord at a gathering of fire in Johannesburg, the Lord said to us, what are you going to do? Are you ready for a million people? Are you ready for a million souls? And that he's talking about harvest. The, the revival is about harvest. It's not just about having a wonderful feeling and, and goosebumps. It's about harvest. Are we ready for a million people? What are you going to do if a thousand people pitch at your house? Are you ready to make disciples? And that's why the Lord has put on my heart to actually share practical teachings of how to practically have a house church. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be an elder. You don't have to be a leader. All you have to do is be willing and say, Lord, my house is your house. Come and teach me how to make, uh, how to have a house church and God will bring the living stones and those are the people that you disciple because the Lord has called us to disciple the nations and that is every single one, every one of you that is watching this video now, you are called in the Great Commission to make disciples and uh, I'm here to help you to make disciples of the nations but the Lord wants you to disciple nations and that happens one person at a time but we need to have these Awesome gatherings of glory and fire so that people's lives will be transformed, their prayer lives will be transformed, and then they will take that house in turn back into the marketplace. They will take that glory back into their businesses and they will take it back home and their schools and wherever they are and the fire of God is going to go there and they will then have to start having meetings in their homes and so the fire will spread as the fire spread from, spreads from one house to the next house. So it's not just going to be in one building, in one church. It's going to spread. And whoever wants the fire, whoever wants the glory of God, you can have it if you're prepared to, to, to walk with the Lord and to make way for the Lord. And he says, prepare the way of the Lord for the make straight because the Lord is coming. Make straight his paths. And the Lord wants to come into your house. He wants to come into your city. So... Um, it also says here in, in 2 Chronicles 7, 1, it says, When Solomon had finished praying, okay, so this is after 2 Chronicles 5, it says, When Sol Solomon had finished praying, <clears throat> excuse me, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering. So here we see the glory of the Lord. We see the fire coming when the offering and the sacrifices are right. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest, listen to this, the priest could not enter the house of the Lord. So you imagine the priests were supposed to come in the house. They couldn't enter the house because of the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. They couldn't walk in the manifest Shekinah glory of God was there. And this is what we're going to see. And when the, when the Gentiles, when the, let's say the Gentiles in today's terms as the unbelievers, when the unbelievers see the glory of the Lord enter the house, they're going to come in. They're going to, they're going to come from the, the nations. They're going to come running because the earth is so dark. They're going to come running into the glory of God and, and they're going to get saved. It's not a matter of how to get people saved. The glory of God is going to save people. The main question is, how do you make disciples? Getting people saved is going to be the easiest thing on earth because the glory of God is going to touch them. They're going to actually cry out to, to the Lord. They're going to cry out in the streets. When the revival that we're trusting God 
hits the streets. It's going to, people are going to cry out in repentance and they're going to be looking for people that know the Lord and they're going to come to your house and they're going to say, pray for me. You're going to bring them in. They're going to encounter God and then you're going to disciple them. So we need to get ready for this great outpouring that's coming to our nation and to the nations, to Africa and to Israel and to the whole earth as the Lord has shown us in the blueprint for revival. It's, it's, it's an it's a international uh, revival that's going to hit all the nations. Now, when we look at the, the next area, uh, next, uh, uh, you know, when the, when the apostles received the pattern from Jesus, Jesus was the cornerstone. So for three and a half years, Jesus walked with the disciples. They received the pattern from Jesus. He then tells them to go and wait f- for the power of the Holy Spirit. And he tells them to go and tarry in Jerusalem. And they were in the upper room for 10 days. And it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with one accord in one place. And you'll see one accord, one place. You will see it with Solomon. They were in one place. They were in one accord. And when when they were playing together as one, it says there that they were playing together. The trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound. This is a harmony. This is symphony. When we make one sound, the fire will come down. He says, when they were one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound. So there's a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they appeared to them, divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. This is what we're waiting for. This is what we, we are pressing in. We want to see the glory of God. We want to see the fire of God manifest on His people. And they began to be filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So this is... The pattern that we see over and over, we see the pattern was correct. The fire came and the glory came and people's lives were changed. And now we're going to see it. Uh, This is what revival is about, is the glory of God coming into, into your city, into your town and transforming your city when the glory of God comes into your city. So... The next thing we're going to look at is, is, is what is the pattern for the church? So, so we've looked at this before. G- we first, the Lord revealed to us, and, and it's very clear to see that Jesus is the pattern for the church. He says, I'm the chief cornerstone. He is the chief cornerstone. Jesus is not just the cornerstone. He's the foundation. Jesus is the builder. It is the, we are called the body of Christ. So Jesus is the chief cornerstone. And there's so many scriptures around the, the, the pattern of, of the church. But Jesus is the pattern for the church. We see the pattern released in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which we call the Gospels. We then see it going into another dimension in the book of Acts with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit because now the pattern was correct. There were 12 disciples. There was 120 in the outer room. And they were in one accord in one place. They had the doctrine of Christ, which were the teachings of Christ with inside of them for three and a half years. He was teaching them. They had the Word of God in them. And suddenly he poured out the Spirit of God, the fire of God. And the, the whole church was launched into the... Into, into a power dimension that turned the known world, world upside down. And God wants to do that again. That is really what revival is all about, is when the, the Lord comes to revive that which is dead. And God wants to raise the dead church. He wants to raise us up so that we are not having these the, so many funerals anymore. We are actually raising the dead instead of burying the dead. So we see the pattern released. And the Lord wants us to, to bring, come into that pattern that He gave us in the, in, the, in, in the Gospels and the book of Acts and the rest of the New Testament. So the church is not an organization. We're a body. And it, the church is an organism. Um, and, you know, both an organism and an organization has a structure. So if you look at an organization, it's got a structure. Organization has got a structure. It's, it, it's got an organogram. There's a structure. There's rules and everything like that. But an, an organism like a body has also got a structure. But it's a, the difference between the church, man-made church, and the God-made church is that the man-made church is man is now building the church. The God-made church is when God builds it. And this is a temple that man cannot build. We're called to build his church that actually says, I'm going to build the church. He says, unless the Lord builds builds a house, they that labor, labor in vain. So God doesn't want us to labor in vain anymore. He's going to build himself a house. And when the pattern is right, according to him, not according to us, he will send his glory. He will pour out his glory. And the glory will be a confirmation. The glory will be a confirmation that he's pleased with the brethren that are dwelling together in one accord and in unity and humility. Okay, so the Lord is bringing that to get pass right across the nations, not just in South Africa. So now is, the question is, how do, we, 
how do we do house church? Practically now, what do you do now? Uh, and, and it's like I said, it's taken me over 18 years to discover this pattern, which is based on the tabernacle that was, was given to Moses and the tabernacle, which is the outer court, the holy place and the holy, holy of holies. The Lord has shown me that you need to take people from the outer court into the holy place and into the holy of holies. And every time we gather, that is what I do. The Lord has shown me that you need everyone. Uh, there's a lot of people in a service. Let's say when you're having a service or a gathering, um, you'll find people in the outer court. You'll find them. They, they're upset with their wives. They're upset with their husbands. They're upset with their children. They come in there. They're not ready to praise and worship. So you've got to take them through the outer court. And that's where they have to learn. That's where they have to surrender. That's where they have to repent. So um, this, this pattern that I'm giving you now is not casting concrete. The main, the main pr principle that we're following here is that we need to understand where people are spiritually when they come in. We need to understand that the Holy Spirit is the one that's in charge and that we are just facilitating. So although we're so-called leading, we're actually not leading. We want the Holy Spirit to lead. So we want to facilitate a move of the Holy Spirit every time we gather. We want the Holy Spirit to move. So I know that I like to stand back and allow the Holy Spirit to move. Now you take a risk when you do that because the flesh can get involved. People can try and control it. But at the end of the day, I'm prepared to take that risk because I, I want to stand back and I trust the Holy Spirit. I trust God to be able to lead His people. Now, we will. therefore, we will make mistakes. And you will make mistakes. So don't be put up by the mistakes. Uh, it's only dead people that don't, that don't make mistakes. So just relax. If you make mistakes, not a problem. You're welcome to ask questions. You can give your comments below this video. Um, you know, you can send, me, send us emails and ask us questions, which we can address in the, in the, in the videos to follow. So we've made so many mistakes and we are still learning, like I said. And my house is, like I've said before, is a laboratory where I experiment with people and with, and with God. And, we, we, and I'm, I'm trying to find out what pleases the Lord. In other words, we are a, a God-centered church, a God-focused church. And we are looking at what pleases the Lord. What pleases the Lord and what can we do to please Him every time we gather so, so we are experimenting, and I've been exper experimenting for many years, and you're welcome to experiment in your house and say, Father, what, what, would, you, what would please you? And this is our ultimate, uh, uh, the way we work is that our ultimate goal every time we gather is n number one, is we want to see the Lord, and we want to please the Lord. We want to please the Lord. So we are saying we're gathering in your name. We know that you're here but we want to please you. We want to see you. We want to feel your presence. We want to hear your word. We want, we want to please you. And when we do that, he starts to minister to us. And our, our objective is to draw closer to the Lord and help everyone in the service to get closer to the Lord, not just do a teaching uh, at all. A teaching is very important, but what we do is we want to have a divine encounter. So here we go. This is how we do it um, week by week. We have what we call a divine encounter uh, at my house at, at one o'clock Friday afternoons at a house in Edenval Gauteng. This is where we gather and we just we, we come together at one o'clock. And like I said, the goal of the gathering is to is, is to see Jesus. So we, we desire to please God. We desire to please the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Our audience is God and, and, and the cloud of witnesses. We want to see our Abba Father smiling over us. And many times He's shown us that He's pleased or He said He's pleased with us. And there is that nothing that makes me happier than to know that God is pleased with the gathering. And He's saying, I'm happy the way you're gathering. I'm happy with what you're doing. And He starts to pour out His presence. He starts to pour out His fire. He starts to pour out His miracles because we are seeking to please Him in every single gathering. Um, and the question is, did we please Him? Uh, you know, our aim is to please God first. And in so doing, when we please God, He will meet our needs. Uh, and He will minister to each person. E each person that comes here, He ministers to them personally or uh, directly to them. Or He will use someone else to minister to them because we believe in the body ministry. And the, and the body can pray for one another and minister to one another. Um, and yes, there, is mis there are mistakes, there is flesh, but that doesn't put us off. We're going to continue to learn and we're going to continue to grow. Okay, so ultimately the Lord is our agenda. We're here to seek the Lord. Uh, there is a pattern that we follow, but remember something, and, and this is very important. Even the pattern that we have is subject to change. In other words, we have got a pattern, what people would call the order of service. They've got an order of service and they basically start with praise and worship and then they preach. 
And that's basically wherever you go in the world, that's, that's, that's the pattern that the, the church is using for many, many decades. And, um, and one day I asked someone, why do we do it this way? Where did we get it? And the Lord said, and he showed me that I must start using the tabernacle of Moses, the pattern that he gave to Moses, and the pattern that he gave to David, which is a similar pattern, outer court, holy place, and holy of holies. And he said, take the people from the outer court and bring them into the holy of holies, because the veil in the temple has been torn, and we need to bring them up the mountain of God. And I call it the mountain of worship. And we're going to take them from the bottom through to the top. And there's a way to do this. And today I'm just going to give you the overview. And then what we're going to do is another, another video. We're going to go in depth and, and look at each component. Why we do the thanksgiving. Why we do the praise. Why we do the worship. Uh, you know, why we're doing the meal and everything that we do. So I want to just give you an overview now of exactly uh, what we do. Each divine encounter... Each divine encounter that we have and each gathering we have is based on the book, The Divine Encounter, which you can get on our website. Um, and in that book, the Lord taught me how to encounter Him personally. So I've had many, many years of encountering the Lord and, I, and He taught me how to encounter Him. Every time I pray, I can encounter the Lord and I, and I teach people how to encounter the Lord. So if you, if you can't encounter the Lord and you, you're struggling in your prayer life, um, just go to our website and get, get, get the book. Um, and so the, the practical aim is, is to get to a place of spirit and truth worship, which is what the Father is seeking in John 4.23. Um, because the Father is seeking worshippers that are worshipping in spirit and truth. So, to, so basically what happens is, so towards the end of the meeting, our goal is to, to be all worshipping Him, all right, in spirit and truth. So we start in the outer court and we start with lunch and we start eating and, and fellowshipping and we move higher and higher up the mountain of worship. Uh, let me ju just show you over here. I've just drawn it here. It's like the, the, there's a mountain that we are climbing every time we gather. And, and let me just show you how it works. Okay, so um, w when people come, a lot of them are actually at the bottom of the mountain. Okay, so some of them are not even on the mountain. So basically, they got to get on the mountain. And this is really over here. We could just say, okay, over here is really the outer court. In the outer court, the mountain of worship. So we've got the outer court. So now basically over here, we've got surrender. Okay. And, and the outer court is now, even before you get to surrender, we have the lunch and we have the fellowship. And here we have, we have the word. And the living word that we have is testimonies. And we share testimonies at the table. So we go from the word and we're talking about testimonies. And, and people are getting to know each other. And it's real fellowship. Normally when you go to church, you're not really fellowshipping. You're actually, you're going there and you do praise and worship and then you have a, a, a lecture, a teaching, okay? Um, but that's not fellowship. And so we, we are, the Lord has shown us that we need to eat together and fellowship. And this part here, just the, the testimonies and the lunch, which, we, you know, this is the lunch when we're eating together, breaking bread, as it says in the book of Acts, they broke bread from house to house. This takes about two hours, just the lunch. So having a house gathering isn't something you can do in an hour. Okay, you know, there's, there's only so far you can go in an hour. So this really takes hours. And if you want to get this done in an hour, you're not really going to be effective in an hour. So you need to put time aside and people need to put time aside to seek the Lord. Because when you're really hungry for the Lord, uh, you need hours with the Lord. Okay, so we've got the lunch. And then we, we take them into the lounge after the, the table. We go and we surrender and we repent. Okay, so then we get to yeah the middle of the mountain. Then we can say this is the holy place. Now the, the holy place is where we, we get them filled in. If you look at the menorah, which is the seven spirits of God, we get them filled with the spirit of God. We get them filled with the word. We get them filled with his love. So this is, the, this is what we call the infilling. Okay, that's the infilling, and this here, this is the infilling, and before we get filled in, this is, we breathe out in, re, in, in repentance and surrender. Okay, so over here, we get washed with the word, people are sharing their testimonies, people are getting encouraged, the level of faith is rising, and then we get into the holy place. Okay, and, and the holy place is where we get filled. Okay, we get filled with the, and I put songs on here, talking about the Holy Spirit, talking about Father's love. Um, also focusing here on the blood. We put on the blood songs. Okay, so I don't want to get into too much depth over here, but it's going to take too much time now. But I'm just giving you an overview. And then we, over here, we start breaking into, 
into T, which is the thanks. Okay, so we are, we get thanksgiving, and then we get praise, which is the P, and then we get the worship. And now we're at the top of the mountain. The worship is at the top of the mountain. At the top of the mountain, the Father downloads the pattern. The Lord downloads the blueprint. And this is where we get the word of the Lord. This is where we get the, the spirit of prophecy flows. And so over here is where the glory is. The glory is at the top of the mountain. And so every gathering, we go from the bottom to the top. And the aim is to get everyone from the bottom onto the top. Uh, to the top. And we... And so this is why it takes some time sometimes because you've got to explain to people what's happening. And the more people that get to the top and the more people that can be in unity, the quicker you can go to the top of the mountain, into the glory, into the fire, into the spirit realm. And, when we, and, and the more people you get there, the more anointed the service is. So it's not really up to the band or the worship team. You know, sometimes it looks like they're anointed, sometimes it's not. It's actually the whole team is including everyone in the room, not just the people that are, say, the, the, the psalmists. Everyone needs to be in the Spirit. So that's why the Lord taught me, He says, take them from the outer court, because you, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And you need to know that, that in, in, your, in your house church, there could be someone that's really battling with unforgiveness. So somewhere along the line here, they should be forgiving the person, because if they're unforgiveness, they won't be able to get here. They need to forgive to be able to worship. And so the Lord will deal with these things. As, they, as they're going through worship, the Holy Spirit will be dealing with them. And there's a war. By the way, there's a, there's a fight to get to the top here. There's a demonic resistance at every, every level. The enemies are going to resist and you've got to press through all these levels. The Lord has shown us this. there's a level here. Two, one, two, three. At Thanksgiving, you have to break through from Thanksgiving to praise. Break through in, from praise into worship. But there's, there's levels here. There's different levels and there's different devils. And so every time you get to a different level, there's a, there's a, there's a resistance. And when you, you know how to break through these resistance levels and the people in the team, which is everyone in the room, can understand how to worship God, you can break through into the, into the, into the glory of God. And that's what's happening with us as we start to train people, as we start to go. And the, and the team, well, the group becomes a team and the team can understand this. And we can learn to worship together like a rowing team. And we can learn how to worship together. The, the more we are in unity, the more the presence of God manifests. A and God commands a blessing with His unity. So when we come together to worship, it's not everyone for themselves. Everyone can do their own thing. We need to actually be, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We need to say, what is the Holy Spirit saying? And, and flow together. And we can see what the Holy Spirit is doing with the rest of the team. So we've got to learn to flow with the team as opposed to now play our own tune. Because he wants us to be a symphony. And in a symphony, everyone with their instrument, different instruments, needs to be harmonizing with the rest. And they need to be playing together. So when we come together to worship, we all need to intertwine and be, and be centered to the Holy Spirit in our brother and sister. And say, Lord, we want to bring you a pleasing sacrifice today. And the Lord is looking for worship in spirit and in truth. And he wants us to be in one accord. So those are the requirements that he has. And so we need to teach people, you need to teach your people how to worship God. Because most of the time people haven't been taught how to worship. They don't know how to do thanksgiving, praise and worship. Now why are we doing this? So if, if they understand that this is a way that we are ascending in the spiritual realm. We are ascending into the highest level of warfare, which is worship. And when we're worshiping, God starts to pour out His judgments on our enemies. God starts to heal the sick and raise the dead and do miracles. When we can truly worship God in spirit and, and, and truth in one accord, whether there's five of you or, or 500 of you, it doesn't matter. Um, but the more people that can get here, and if you get all of the people in the room here, <laughs> you're going to experience such, the such manifest presence of God if you, if you can actually worship God in unity and in one accord. Okay, so that kind of just gives you an overview of what, I, what I'm talking about when I say the, the worship mountain or the, the mountain of worship. Hopefully that helps you. And just to understand where we're going and what the journey is. So we start in the outer court and we start what I call lunch and stones <laughs> or canonia, which is now really the word for, for communion and communing with each other and sharing and breaking bread. 
So we start uh, with a bring and share lunch. We don't make the lunch complicated, we make it simple. We don't normally just tell people to bring uh, cooked chickens, not, uh, not live chickens, and maybe some bread and some juice or something like that. Make it simple, whatever you like to eat, but don't make it a catering exercise. Otherwise, that'll distract, and then the host has to do all the cooking and the preparation. So we try and make it as simple as possible. It is important to eat, so the food is important, but it's not a catering exercise. So each per- then at, that, at the lunch table, each person... I let each person take a few minutes um, to share. Some people might take a bit long, so you've got to maybe cut them a bit short so that other people... So each person really needs an opportunity to, to share their stone, uh, although that's not uh, possible every time because we find that as we take hands, as we take hands, as we open in prayer, the Holy Spirit starts moving immediately. And then there's, there's words, there's visions at the table, uh, there, there's prophecy. Some, and then sometimes the Holy Spirit starts touching some. we start prophesying over somebody, and there's just holy order. Some people might think it's chaos. No, it's holy order. Holy order is when the Holy Spirit takes over and He brings about divine order and He suddenly starts moving. And then we are always sensitive. Where's the Holy Spirit is moving? If the Holy Spirit's moving, we don't want to stop Him. We want to say, if suddenly someone starts laughing, we want to laugh with them. If someone starts weeping, we want to weep with them. The, the Bible says, weep with those who weep. La- rejoice with those who, who are rejoicing. So if someone's rejoicing and God starts to move on somebody with joy, we, we, we want to actually enter into what the Lord is doing. And so what happens, we've got to be sensitive to where the Lord is moving. And if He starts moving at the table, we go in. And sometimes, uh, you know, I can hardly even eat because God is so busy at the table. And so I just want to focus on the Lord. So the food kind of almost, well, it doesn't matter to me anymore because I've now got some meat from heaven to eat. And I love His presence. And I love to see the Lord moving and touching His people. So that's really what happens at the table. We share our testimonies. We encourage one another. We might pray for each other at this time. But generally, we just share our stones, which is our testimonies. Now, later on, I'll, I'll, just, I'll tell you why we do this. The, the reason behind it, because the Lord instructed us this uh, specifically to eat together in 2012. He told us we need to eat together and we need to uh, share stones. And I'll tell you exactly why we're doing that as well. And this normally, the eating and that uh, around the table takes about two to three hours. And it's great fun as we share and we eat and we watch the Lord's move, uh, the Lord move in a, in a powerful way. Uh, everyone's faith is starting to rise as testimonies are shared because that's what happens when you share testimonies. People's faith, they're getting encouraged. Um, and, and, and God is actually delivering people right there at the table from fear and unbelief. Um, and this is, uh, this is, the, this is the, the time. The time that we spend at the table gets people ready for the thanksgiving, the praise, and the worship, which I showed you over here. So here is the table over here. And then when we go to the lounge, we start with surrender songs and, and repentance songs. And then we go into the blood of Jesus, maybe one or two songs on the blood. And then we go. So I, I've got a specific choice of songs. And, and based on themes, I choose the songs because I want to, the Lord saying, take them through this process. Sometimes we can go from the table and just start with thanksgiving and praise and worship. We can skip it because God did all of this at the table. So you've got to discern where are the people. So when you're leading worship, you've got to discern where are the people. Um, wh- wh- where's the Holy Spirit moving? So because the Holy Spirit is, is moving with the people. And if the people are still in the outer court, you've got to spend more time here. And you might not even get to worship. And you might have to have a few meetings just and just go you know, up to maybe Thanksgiving or praise. But you might not give in to worship. Or you might just spend the whole meeting here in the outer court. It's not a problem. Most of Jesus' ministry on earth was in the outer court. It's only in the book of Revelation do we see, you know, worship. You know, Jesus wasn't walking around with a worship team. So, and this is a, a you know, important thing to understand. Jesus met the people where they're at. And we need to meet them where they're at. And then take them from the next step. So these are steps that we're going to take them up the mountain of God. Okay, into the glory of God. And ultimately we want to bring the people. And by the power of the Spirit, not ourselves, the Holy Spirit brings them up the mountain so that they know what the journey is about. They know what we're doing in a service. They know what we're doing in a gathering, saying, ultimately, our goal today is encounter the glory of God. And there's a way to encounter these, these principles in the Word of God that are very clear. And when you apply the principles, they work every single time. They're actually not just principles, but they are laws. They are spiritual laws that when you apply them, it opens up the heavens. And these are the things that the Lord has taught us over these years, is that there are certain words in, in, in the scriptures that are part of the pattern that when you apply them, it just works every time. It's like confessing your sins. If you confess your sins, He will forgive you your sins. That is a law. It's a law of forgiveness. 
Okay, so like I said, normally it takes two to three hours. Now, once that is finished, we go into what we call um, TPW, which is the Thanksgiving praise and worship. And we, so we, we, are, we are aiming now to bring a pleasing sacrifice to the Lord. We've, we've gathered around the table, this unity now, and suddenly we take the team, which is around the table. Now, normally you can only fit about 12 people around your table or 10 or 5. It depends how big your table is, how big your apartment is. So you don't want to have like 30 or 40 people around a table because you can't talk to them personally. It's too big. So, uh, you know, we, we look at a maximum number of maybe 12 or 14 people. Um, when, it, when it gets more than 14 or 16, then it's out of hand because you, not everyone gets a turn to share their testimony. And this whole, the whole purpose of this part here and the, and the house church is to keep it small so that, and it powerful and, and, and deep because now we can go deep with these people. But if you suddenly have 100 people, you can't go that deep. So when we have our open gatherings, we cannot go as deep as we can is when we're doing the house church gathering. When we have open gatherings and we have a bigger meeting with 100 people or 50 people, you can't go that deep because now there's different tables and different people are eating together. But, um, but at least at each table, you can go and you can start fellowshipping with other people at their tables. All right, so... This is this is such an important part. Part now we we I take songs and I I do surrender songs. So you can do it either manually. Manually is without music. You can just say let's surrender right now. Um, but I normally use music and I take them with surrender songs. You can go on our website under the worship uh, list on our website. You can find the, the Friday Divine Encounters and you'll see I've got the the songs in a specific order. And I've always got the surrender songs. Uh, encountering songs right at the beginning and and also the repentance song so the surrender and repentance goes together and this is the outer court where we lay our lives down at the altar as a living sacrifice and we always start with surrender and repentance and uh, you know unless the lord actually did that at the table and i can feel actually the people have already surrendered and they're ready for thanksgiving praise and worship but i don't just normally just start a meeting and just go into thanksgiving praise and worship i i, I normally start because there's normally somebody that's really battling. And if they're really battling, I focus on the weakest member. And not that I highlight them or, or identify who it is. The Holy Spirit knows who it is. Sometimes I might know. Sometimes I don't have to know. But it's like you've got to be centered to the Holy Spirit where the people are. And He will focus on the weakest person. And we've got to wait for that person and help them. So if you've got people and if you're in a pl place where you just want to worship because you're ready then you're more mature and were you in a stronger position and so let the let the strong people bear with the weak ones and wait for them and encourage them and pray for them so that the whole group and the whole team can get to the to the top of the mountain together it's like a mountain climbing team you don't want to leave the members at the bottom you want to take the whole team to the top and so that's why it takes sex our, our, our gatherings take you know just a normal gathering normally takes about at least five hours or six hours so it's not just like you know Oh, you know, two hours. Two hours is far, far too short. Okay, so, but, you know, I don't want to do to church as normal. I want to encounter the Lord, and we want to encounter the Lord, and we really, we, we really attract really hungry and thirsty people, so they don't mind going on for four or five hours, because the time flies when the Spirit of God is flowing. So we surrender, and the Lord has taught us the deeper the, the surrender and the, great, the, the greater the encounter. So it is very important that you teach the people how to surrender and to repent, uh, you might even want to do teachings on them. I've got lots of teachings on that as well. So if you want to let them listen to those teachings. Um, the key to revival is what he's shown us is surrender and, and repentance. Okay, so this is a revival of repentance. But we need to surrender our lives as a living sacrifice to the Lord, as, as to be a pleasing sacrifice to the Lord. Um, this is a word that he gave us um, a while ago, about a year ago. He says, I'm releasing the spirit of revival to those who are hungry enough to climb the staircase of surrender into the blood. <laughs> I think I'll read it again. I'm releasing the spirit of revival to those who are hungry enough to climb the staircase of surrender into the blood. So there's a spirit, there's a, the spirit of revival is available for those who are hungry enough to climb the staircase of surrender. So there's a staircase of surrender. So you're climbing in and higher into the kingdom dimension when you're surrendering and you're surrendering your children, you're then you're surrendering your finances. These different parts that you need to surrender. And it, 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 the word goes on to say, we are to take the substance which he has he is birthing in the systems in this season. Take it to the vessel that you prepared. So the vessel you prepared is is the church, um, the house church you've got, your ministry, your business. Take 
the substance, which is the spirit of revival, take it to the vessel that you have prepared, and the spirit of revival is in the midst of us when we gather together in one accord. So we need to take it to the vessel, but he says the spirit of revival is in our midst when we're in one accord. So there's the key word, one accord. And, and like I said, as we surrender and repent, I have songs on, on the blood of Jesus. And then I focus on, I move into infilling and I'm looking at, okay, now we need to get filled with the Holy Spirit. And I put on songs with the Holy, uh, about the Holy Spirit or I might just take them into the love. But I look at, I'm just sensing the Holy Spirit because I've got literally, literally thousands of songs that I can choose from. Um, and I'm just waiting on the Lord to give me the next song. So I, most of the time, I don't even know which songs I'm going to play. I just, I just, as I'm playing, the Holy Spirit shows me the next and the next song uh, to go with the flow of the Holy Spirit. And it depends where the people are. So I can't decide the night before what songs I'm playing the next day or the sets. A lot of, obviously, you know, when you come to a band or something like that, they have to have a set. But, you know, with, the, with all the songs that we've got on, on, online that you can use, you, you can just be led by the Spirit and, because you don't even have to learn uh, to play the song. So that is why this is very useful because you don't have to be a psalmist or a guitarist or anything to lead worship. You can just lead it because we've got all these awesome songs, anointed songs from all over the world, from the body of Christ that you can use freely, which we just stream off uh, YouTube on our website. All right, so we do, we then go get filled. And when we are filled, we go, then we break through into Thanksgiving. And we have a Thanksgiving song or maybe two songs on Thanksgiving. Or we can do manual Thanksgiving where we just say, thank you, Lord. Uh, and we go around the, around the room and just say thank you to the Lord for different things. Um, then we break through into praise and I bring praise songs and we give him praise and boast in his greatness. And a praise song is talking about how great he is, how, like a song, how great, the, you know, how great the art when we are singing and we're saying God is great. All right. And God is awesome. God is great. That is a praise song and a proclamation song. Um, but more of a praise song. And when we are praising God, we're not worshiping. We are praising him. And when we are worshiping Him, we're not praising Him. When we're worshiping, we adore Him. Uh, we bow and kiss the sun. Worship means to kiss, like a dog would lick your hand. And worship is when we adore Him. And it's a different kind of, it's completely, the words are different. And the anointing is different on a worship song than it is on a praise song. And it is on a, a, um, a warfare song or a prayer song. There's lots of different kinds of songs. But I'm just talking about thanksgiving, praise, and worship right now. So when we bow and we take them into that place of intimacy, and when people just get lost in His glory, and there we find in the worship, the eagles, which are the prophets, um, see the most when we're in worship. So the, that is why it's so important that we get to the place of worship, because when we get to the place of worship, many things are happening in the Spirit. And, and the Lord is really starting to fight for us when we get to the place of worship. He fights the battles for us on earth while we are worshiping Him and just looking at Him and gazing at Him. He's sorting out our enemies for us. So that is such a, a powerful way of, of, of not just encountering God, but of doing warfare, because now we are entering, we've entered His rest, we are worshiping Him, and God is actually judging our enemies. Um, and we, and, and this is very important, we just follow as He leads. If He suddenly starts moving in a direction, we follow Him. So this whole pattern is subject to the Holy Spirit. So if He wants to change it, He can change it. But we are always looking for the move of the Spirit. We are always looking. But Ultimately, we always want to get to a place, and it doesn't always happen, but most of the time we get to a place where we can end off with worship and just adore the Lord, and we want to include thanksgiving, and we want to include praise. We just want to tell Him that we love Him, because that's really what worship is about, just saying that I love you, Jesus. Okay, so um, when we finish, now we start to land. When we land, uh, I call it landing, because now you're coming down, and we're in a place of worship. We come, we come and land, or we just quieten them over here and we say, okay, now we're going to, we're going to just bring down the music. Um, I, I then go around the room and let everyone share. What did they get from the Lord? Now, a lot of times your, the words that you get might be personal or might be for another place, another time. But whatever you feel is for public consumption, you just, you just share it. What is for the group? Maybe you've got a word for someone else. You just share it. And I go around the room and we share these words, we record the words, and we then later um, you know, send them out to the people that were in, in the group and in, in, in the service. So this is such an important thing is that we learn to allow the body of Christ to operate in the prophetic and if they make mistakes, we can help them because, you know, who doesn't make mistakes? And we, so that doesn't, somebody doesn't have to queue up to give a prophetic word. Everyone's going to get prophetic words. Every week we get prophetic words. Every week. Um, 
the, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, so when, when we are testifying, when we are focusing on him, the spirit of prophecy is always present. And um, he lo- loves to give his people words and of encouragement and, uh, and, 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 and give his children healing and everything like that. So this is when we, we, we take those words, we share the words, and we pray those words in. We, we share a word, we pray it in, we share the words, we pray it in. And we, we also pray for individuals as the Lord leads us. This is the time to cast out demons, heal the sick. And so this can carry on maybe for another hour. So we start at one and we normally end at about six o'clock. And then sometimes the Holy Spirit is lingering and then we have an after party. <laughs> uh, and it can go on till later, you know, maybe to eight, nine o'clock or eight o'clock or whatever. Like it, it really it can go for seven, eight hours quite easily. Uh, and some of the times we've gone to 12 hours or more, but it's we carry by the anointing. Also, uh, I just want to say, you know, we, 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 we normally do the water baptisms before the whole gathering starts. So before the lunch, do your water ba- baptisms in your swimming pool, in your bath or wherever. Uh, you know, most, most houses will have a bath in it and if, just, just, just put them in the, in, in the bath and baptize them and get them baptized with the Holy Spirit. And we've got videos on our website uh, on the school of ministry to show you how to baptize people and to cast out demons and all that. So this is very, very important. So, um, okay, so that's just the overview. Uh, later, I, I'll be covering um, why we do what we do above. I'll go into more depth why we're doing it. And then a more in-depth of how to facilitate the divine encounter. I'll go into more depth about the table and in more depth about how to lead the worship, the songs, how do you choose the songs, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, just write your comments below or send us an email uh, and maybe I can address as I'd like to look at addressing some of your questions in the upcoming videos. So thank you so much. Uh, just uh, also let us know about your testimonies, how the house churches are going. And if you need a house church in your area and you want to know if there's a house church in your area, just send us an email uh, and, and we'll, we'll get back to you because we, we've got a map and we're showing you, you know, where the house churches are. So God bless you. And have an awesome, awesome week this week. God bless you.